So the title of our study this evening is Hearing God in a Chaotic World. It's the theme for the entire weekend, but I just want to use that theme for my, my study tonight. I also want to ask you, please, if you have a cell phone, can you put it on silent? Amen. I really appreciate that. Please put your phone on silent if you're using it for the Bible app. When the phone goes, I'll never forget, I was speaking at a congregation and the phone went off. The lady answered it and literally started talking. We don't want to do that. You can't even do that in a court of law. We're before the judge of the universe. Put those phones on silent. Thank you very much. Number two, we're going to pray as my custom is. I ask for the congregation to pray within your heart. The prayer is we're asking for the Holy Spirit. We're asking for the Holy Spirit to speak to us and to give us a conviction for sin and a love for righteousness. Amen. Righteousness. We want to live righteous lives because God is good. I'm going to kneel. You can remain seated if you choose. And remember, we're praying in our hearts. Lord, give me a hatred for sin and a love for righteousness. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you will speak through the word by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, two months ago, I was at the gym. I go to the gym every day. It's part of our health message. And I keep my wallet in my car. After the gym, I work out, I went to my car, and I opened the glove compartment to, to see if my wallet was there. And to my shock, the wallet was not there. So I thought that I left it at home. So I rushed home and I searched the house for five minutes, could not find it. So I took off, I went back to the gym, and I asked the worker at the front desk, did anyone turn in a wallet? And she said, no. I said, oh no, where did I place this wallet? You know how it is men when we lose our wallets, that's chaos. And so I went to my car as I left the, the gym, uh, the front desk, I'm walking to my car and I receive a text message. And I checked the message and the message re read, did you just make a purchase for $430? And it was from American Express. As soon as I saw that message, I said, Man, my wallet was stolen. I had to call American Express, cancel the card. I called my bank. I ran to the, I drove to the police department, filled out a report. Brothers and sisters, I had to go through the system with the DNV. It was absolute chaos. I got another alert. Those, those folk, they took over $400 out of my account. I don't know how they did it, but they took a lot of money. My wallet was gone, over $500 in cash. I could have used that for my gas money coming here. <laughs> All that was gone, and that was very, very chaotic. Have you ever gone through something chaotic? What is, if we're going to study the Bible, let's, let's work with a definition, Okay. Now, tonight's not too formal. This is just this is like Friday night vespers for me. So if I ask a question, please give me a response. Is that all right? Yeah. We're just talking. The definition of chaotic is in a state of complete confusion and what, everybody? Disorder. Disorder. Now, I'm going to ask a question. Where do we find chaos taking place first in the Bible? What location? Yes. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Let's take our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. Let us turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Chaos is disorder. Out of order. Chaotic. We are living in a chaotic world. The first time we find chaos. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Are you there? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. I need everybody turning in the Bibles or on your app. I just see some people looking at me. Open the Bible or use the app. <laughs> the Bible is so powerful. 
The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, are you there, family? Yeah. The Bible reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy, what? Heart. So loose, this is referring to the mind, okay, the mind. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like who everyone? This brother has the nerve to say, I'm going to be just like God. That's chaos. Now, now follow my words. Chaos began in Lucifer's what? mind. This chaos grew to such a degree. Listen to what Revelation chapter 12 reads. Revelation 12 now. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. How great was this chaos? Revelation chapter 12. The Bible here reads in Revelation 12 verse 7. Revelation 12 verse 7. Are you there? Amen. If you need help finding Revelation, come to the altar. <laughs> we all know that's the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 12. Are you there, family? Amen. The Bible reads in verse 7, And uh, there was, what's that word? War. War in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels. The Bible clearly tells us, in this perfect environment in heaven, the Bible says war broke out. Now, the word war in itself, does that, does that connote uh, chaos, yes or no? That's a very chaotic situation if war is transpiring in a location. This place was so chaotic, Jesus is warring against Satan. So we find here that chaos takes place. The very first occurrence of chaos was in a perfect environment, and it was dealing with the mind. Question. This is not a trick question. Where is the next location where we find chaos? I love it. Let's turn to Genesis. Let's turn to Genesis, the book of Genesis. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and we know this very well. Genesis chapter 3, the Bible reads here, of course, God tells Adam, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or you will surely die. Now listen to what the serpent says in Genesis 3 verse 1. Are you there, family? The Bible reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto what, to, to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now listen to the text in verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Let's pause right here. In this text, is Satan, this serpent, is he coming after the, after the mind of the woman? Is he coming after Eve's mind? Yes. Listen to what Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets. Now, we at Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that Ellen White had the prophetic gift. Does the microphone go out or something? We believe that Ellen White had the prophetic gift. Amen. We believe that. She is a prophet of God. 
Now, some people don't like that. I remember when I started in my, in my church in 2015, a uh, senior pastor for the first time, I quoted three texts from Ellen White. The seven-day Adventist at the door, he thanked me for the message, and he said the problem was you quoted too much Ellen White. And this is the problem. This is why so many Adventists have no idea what we believe in. Brothers and sisters, we believe in Ellen White. I love it. The serpent comes on the scene. He's talking to Eve, and he's getting to her mind. Now, the serpent is slick. He is slick. Listen to what she says in Preach Arts and Prophets. Listen to this quote. She says here, But the serpent continued in a musical tone with subtle praise of her surpassing what? Loveliness. And his words were not what, everybody? You know when it says surpassing loveliness, you know what that means? That means that the serpent was complimenting Eve. He was complimenting her beauty. You know why? Because the Bible says in Ezekiel 28 that Satan, Lucifer, was perfect in beauty. He knew because of his beauty, it rose pride inside of him. So what he does now, he says, hey, Eve, you are absolutely gorgeous. And the thing is, he understood the nature of women before the fall of man. Because by nature, women love compliments. Now, come on, ladies. Come on. Come on, ladies. You tell a lady, hey, I like your dress. Oh, thank you. I got a Nordstrom's. It was on sale. It was on the clearance rack. Do you like my shoes? These red bottoms. I got these on sale. Come on. Women love compliments. There's another, that's, just, that's not a sinful thing. That's how God created women. They're more, now men love compliments as well. But with women, it's different because women are emotional by nature. And he tells this girl, man, you're gorgeous. He's getting to the mind of Eve. He gets to her mind. She picks the fruit. She takes it from him. She eats the fruit and sin enters the world. How bad is sin? Go to Genesis 3. You should be in Genesis 3. Let's go to verse 17. Let's go to verse 17. Genesis 3, verse 17. The Bible says in Genesis 3, verse 17, and, and unto Adam, this is God speaking, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now watch verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. That's not talking about marijuana, by the way. No, you got to make that disclaimer. The Bible says sin affected the world to such a degree that the ground was affected. Now, did the ground ever sin? The soil never sinned, but sin is so destructive, now you have thorns on roses. Why? Because sin affected nature. Now we have typhoons and earthquakes. Have you ever been through an um, earthquake? Did you like it? Do you remember the first time you felt the earth move? I remember I was in Loma Linda. I'll never forget it. I came to Loma Linda in 1999 after I graduated from Oakwood University. Amen. <laughs> there in Loma Linda for the first time, man, in 1999, that apartment shook. You know, the first thing I did, I didn't get on my knees. I called my mama. <laughs> I don't know what I thought she was going to do. She was all the way in West Palm Beach, Florida. I was absolutely terrified. These things occur because now the ground is cursed. The world is in chaos because of sin. Verse 16, go to verse 16 in Genesis 3. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. The Bible says you're going to give birth, but it's going to be painful. Anybody here have children? Did you give natural birth without an epidural? Did it feel good? I'll never forget. You know, before sin, this, this is how I picture it. 
before sin, when someone is giving birth, the baby will just slide out. <laughs> not, that's just how, not one fraction of pain whatsoever, because pain is a result of sin. The baby will just slide out. Oh, there's a baby. That's, that's just how I believe it. But now that this world is in chaos, women give birth in pain. I never forget when my daughter was born almost 14 years ago. I'm in the room. I'm in the room with my wife, and she had a C-section. And so I'm in there. You see, the entire process is fascinating. And I was rubbing her arm. I was rubbing her arm trying to, you know, you, you want to support your wife. I never forget what she said. She didn't say, oh, praise God for my husband. He's a good man. She said, would you stop that? <laughs> That's just what she said. I'm not making this stuff up. Would you stop it? Man, sorry, sis. I don't know what it's like to have a C-section. But she was fed up. Why? Because this world is in chaos. When sin entered this world, nothing has been the same. The ground has been affected. Now you, that, look, sin is so bad, animals eat other animals. The animal kingdom is affected. The sky is affected. The ground is affected. Women give birth in pain. Why? Because this entire world is in chaos. And we see it here very clearly. We saw what happened a few months ago. Or this last month. This is, this is just absolutely crazy. It's going to there shooting folks. We have mass shootings. And then, of course, we have War. Ukraine and Russia, they're still fighting. I took a, yo, over a year they're still fighting. And you know what I did? I went to Google and I, t I looked at some readings, some statistics. And listen to what it says um, with this war going on. Death, at least 62,000. Non-fatal injuries, almost 60,000. There are, there are over 15,000 people who are missing right now. Look at this. Displaced, meaning homeless. Approximately 17 million people are homeless right now. And we're perfectly fine in this building. You know why these things don't affect us? Because war is not taking place here. Brothers and sisters, if war was taking place in California, we would act differently. What is it like to be homeless and displaced? You don't have mothers and fathers Listen to me, brothers and sisters. This world is in absolute chaos. This is how bad sin is. What else do we have? <laughs> this world is just so messed up. Pride month next month. Now, now I want to say this. I want to say this. Because somebody might call me a bad person. <laughs> Christians... We love everyone. Amen. Amen. Come on, y'all. You're not saying amen because I'm talking about we got to love gays too. You know what we do? We rank and file sins. That's right. Brothers and sisters, we love everyone. Amen. If you're gay, I love you. Amen. If you're trans, I love you. Amen. If you're a lesbian, I love you. Will I stop preaching the truth? I don't love you that much. No, I love Jesus more than I love you. Amen. I will never stop preaching truth to, to compromise and make somebody feel good in their sin. Amen. I'll never forget, I went to Southern University. Anybody know about Southern University? No one knows about Southern University in Tennessee? Yes. Are you a student there? Better go to Oakwood. <laughs> I'm just playing, I'm just playing, I'm just playing. My brother graduated there. I have a twin brother. He graduated from Southern. Southern's good people. I went to Southern University in 2014. And I was connecting a Bible prophecy, last day events, to the LGBT movement. This is before marriage. It was legalized in 2015. So I'm preaching this in 2014 of how bad it's going to be. And I'm preaching this at Southern University for a week in revival. I'm thinking everything is going to be great until the end of the sermon. Girl comes up to me, the student. Why you preach that? See, I didn't know they had an unofficial gay club on their campus. Why you preach that? Students around me. Da, 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 da. 
You know how it is when you're done preaching. People come to you with those empty compliments. Hey, I like your sermon. Okay, or is your life changed? Hey, I like your sermon. That's what I thought they were coming to say. Hey, I like your word. No, they came to me. Rebuke me, brother. I don't like what you said. Southern will never, ever invite me to their, their um, school, ever. I'm blacklisted. And that's not because of my color. <laughs> that's because of the message. And that brother, I will never compromise. You, you send me to Andrews, I will preach the same message. Send me to Oakwood, I will preach the same message. You send me to Loma Linda, I will preach the same message. Hallelujah! They might not like me at Oakwood or Loma Linda, but they'll love me at CYC, though. Ah, I love it. I love it. You never preach to compromise or to please people or tickle ears. No, we're too late in Earth's history. I was preaching at Fresno Academy. They told me to preach for the young people. They had a lot of, you know how these Adventist schools, and uh, they, they bring all of the students from like six different schools. Like Loma Linda, Bakersfield, Gomez, your school was there. And so I'm talking to these, these high school kids. Preach the same message I preached at Southern University. <laughs> I'm done with my message. Praise God, the Holy Ghost was moving until the closing prayer. <laughs> these students came around me. I'm thinking, oh, praise the Lord for your message. We appreciate your message. Nope. Never forget what this one student said, this high school student. A girl. I'm a lesbian. You telling me that I'm not going to be saved? I started talking to her. Her friends were around. All these students were around because she was raising her voice. Yeah, you're going to tell me I'm lost, I'm lost. And then she said, I said, no, you know, I'm just trying to be very nice. Just finish preaching. She said, you're a bigot. You're a bigot. You know what her friends did? How they responded? All of, all of the little classmates said, Ooh! I felt a little embarrassed. You know how it is when someone like puts you down? That sinful nature started to rise. I started to get hot. I just finished preaching. He called me a bigot and all these high school kids are laughing at me. But I praise God. They never invited me again, though. I will still preach it. You don't compromise for anyone. Happy Sabbath, by the way. And I want to say this to be crystal clear. I have gay family members. Still preach the same message. I have gay family members who are married. And I will still preach the same message. And I will still love them. I will still love them, but let me calm down. Look, folks, do we really understand where we are in time? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, do we really understand where we are in time? Pride month, you know how destructive this is? This is the only sin where an entire month is dedicated to it. And let's have a month dedicated to adultery. All you guys who are committing adultery on your spouse, let's be proud of that. Hey, let's have a month about liars. You're a liar? Let's be proud about lying. Yes, but this one. No one celebrates. No other month is dedicated to any other sin, but this one, and this is by design. An enemy hath done this. Do you know that Oh, God. I'm trying to stay calm, Sister Denise. I'm trying to stay calm. This is just Friday night vespers. Do you know that sexual immorality will be the downfall of more Adventists than any other sin? You didn't hear what I just said. Let me drink some water. In the Bible, you have how many commandments? I'm not, this is not a trick question. How many commandments in the Bible? You have one side. The first four is love to whom? The last six is love to whom? In the last six commandments, what is commandment number seven? Isn't that number seven? <laughs> this is not a trick question. What's the seventh commandment? Man, why are you all so slow? Come on. Dude, we're Adventists in here. 
Yes. <laughs> You're hesitating. Yes. Thou shalt not commit what? Adultery. adultery. Is adultery sexual immorality? Yes or no? Yes. yes. What's the 10th commandment? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. In the Ten Commandments, you have two commandments that deal specifically with sexual immorality. You don't have two commandments dealing with the seventh day. Keep the Sabbath holy. You don't have two commandments dealing with honor your father and your mother. No, but you have two commandments dealing specifically with sexual immorality, lusting after your neighbor's wife and committing adultery. Why? God understood. In the last days, Sexual immorality is going to destroy more Adventists than any other sin. I believe that. Has to be. Because, you know, when you look at the story of, um, who was that king? You remember that king? And you had um, the donkey talked. It's slipping my mind now. Oh, yeah, yeah, Balaam and Balak, yes. You remember um, Balaam tried to curse the children of God? You remember that story? Did it work, yes or No. It didn't work. But you know what did work? Listen, listen. Sexual immorality caused thousands of men to perish. They were fornicating with those Moabites. You know what happened? They were committing fornication right before they crossed over the Jordan. Brothers and sisters, we are on the banks of the Jordan now. That story was a type of the anti-type. If we're on the brinks of the Jordan getting ready to cross over into the promised land, what is Satan going to send to cause many to fall? Hmm. Brothers and sisters, I thank God that he's more powerful than Satan. But you know what we do? <laughs> what we do we look at all the things that's transpiring in the world. Is the world in chaos? Yes or no? Yes. Is the, the gay agenda just growing, just going nuts? Yes or no? Yes. Is mass shooting on the rise? Yes or no? Yes. The world is spinning in chaos upside down. The world is a mess. It is chaotic. But what is going on in your life? Now that's the question. That's the question. Let's put the world to the side. What in the world is going on in this building? What's going on in your mind? Because we can look at the sins of the world and we can say the LGBT, they're a mess. The mass shooters, they're crazy. What is going on in your mind? Because Satan is after our minds. This is fascinating because, you know, we need to understand how do we hear from God? How do I hear from God if my world is in chaos? If I am going through a hard time, what's going on in your marriage? I'm not really, you know, so many people, oh, my marriage is great. What? People lie all the time. What's going on? Look, folks, this is real life. I guarantee you there's somebody in this building addicted to pornography. I guarantee it. I was talking just, I was texting someone coming up here, and he, he's been going with um, porn addiction, and we were texting back and forth, and, and, and I was encouraging him that, you, brother, you're going to make it. You will make it. Just keep on going. Brothers and sisters, this porn addiction has so many young people and old and women. A lot of times we say men are dogs. Wait, if men are dogs, women are cats. And cats are sneaky. So let's not say that. All male, female, we're all jacked up without Jesus. That's why we need Jesus so desperately. But the question is asked, how, what do I do if I am in chaos? We need to learn from Jesus. Amen. Matthew 26, last passage. Matthew 26, this is our last pa passage. Matthew 26. 
I mean, if you're in chaos, we need help. I mean, I need help. We all need help from the pastor to the layman. We, we, we need Jesus. So, so how do we hear from God if I'm going through chaos? Matthew 26. Are you there? So we started in heaven, chaotic. We started in the, the Garden of Eden, chaos. The world is in chaos. Now we're going to end the study in another garden with Jesus. How did Jesus respond? Matthew 26, verse 36. Are you there? Amen. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even, listen to the text, y'all, even on to death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, listen to the text. If it be, what's that P word? Possible. Watch the text. Let this cup. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Is he talking about this cup? What cup is Jesus referring to? He's talking about the cup of suffering. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Andrew. See, we just read the Bible. Do you know how powerful this is? Do you know when Jesus was in that garden? Jesus was going through chaos. Do you know when Jesus was in that garden? His mind was disturbed. You didn't hear what I just said. I'm going to prove it. Jesus' mind was rocked. Come on, y'all. Let, let's, let's, let's look at this. The Bible says, how much time do I, I need a clock somewhere? What, what time is it? You better not say that. I really, I really need to know because I don't like, I don't even like preaching long. 815? 815, I promise you we'll be out by 11 or before. <laughs> now check this out. Check how cool the Bible is. Check how cool it is. So Jesus is in trouble. He's in the garden, right? He asks the Father, listen to the prayer request. He prays this prayer request how many times? Three times. So three times. Yes, three times. We know this stuff. He prays three times, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup of suffering. Now let's think. You know what, Ellen White? Question. How old was Jesus when he was in the temple? When he entered the temple for the first time in Luke chapter 2, how old was Jesus? Twelve. You know what Ellen White says? When Jesus was in that temple and he saw that lamb being sacrificed on that altar, Jesus understood, that's me. Jesus saw the lamb dying. That's me. From twelve to 30, how old was he when he died? 33. From 12 to 33, how many years is that? For 21 years, Jesus understood, I am here to die for these folk at CYC. For 21 years, he understood that. But when the time came, Father, is there a plan B? Is there another way out? Why is he asking for a plan B if he knew for 21 years? Why? Because sin will turn you chaotic. Sin will have... Come on, y'all. Question. You know, we, we, some, we just read the Bible sometimes. You know what happened in that garden? Have you ever sinned before? Come on, y'all. Come on. <laughs> Only half of the people responding. Come on, folks. Have you ever sinned before? Yes. Now, as a Christian, when we sin, should we celebrate that? No. When you sin, now we love Jesus. If you don't love Jesus, it's different. But when you love God and you really want to live right and you're full of the Holy Ghost and you fall, do you feel guilty, yes or no? Yes. And you know, sometimes that guilt can last for days. Have you been there before? That guilt can last some for, for years even. 
You're so guilty for what you did, Lord. I'm such a mess. And that's just one sin you committed. Let's just say that's one sin. And you have all this guilt upon you. One sin. In the garden. All of our sins and guilt from Adam to the last baby born was placed upon Jesus in one moment of time. It wasn't like Jesus received the world's sins in increments. When he was 20, God says, I'll give you 10 billion sins. Jesus, when you turn 28, I'll give you another 10 billion. When you turn 33, billion, gazillions, then he didn't receive it in increments. How does someone receive all of our sins, all, the entire world's sins and guilt? And you still don't die. That's why he says sorrowful unto death. This is why Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. Jesus had to come as a man to show us how to live. Jesus had to come as a man because a man cannot die. He had to come as God because a man cannot save you. In that garden, all of our sins were... Let me show you how deep this is. I'm not sure we get what I'm saying. Listen, listen to this. How chaotic was this situation? You know what's so fascinating about this? Jesus is going through such a hard time. How many friends did he bring with him to the garden? Not one of them supported him. You ever had a friend that was not there for you? You ever had a friend that betrayed you? Not one friend was with Jesus, and this situation was so chaotic, the Bible says. He, Jesus, his sweat was as it were, great drops of, what's that word, everyone? Blood falling down to the ground. Have you ever gone through something like that? We have never experienced sweating drops of blood. Mm. This is profound. These disciples, they're sleeping and they're not praying for Jesus. You know who had to leave heaven and come down to support Christ? Who? Gabriel. Gabriel came down from heaven as the covering cherub. He took the place of Lucifer. Gabriel left heaven, came down, and he supported Jesus. You know what Ellen White says that is so profound? Question. Here's a, this is not a trick question. Mm. If all of the world's sins were placed upon you, would you feel depressed? You, I, you wouldn't even, it, it, look, if all of your sins were dumped on me, I would die. Just one person. Jesus took the entire world. Do you think Jesus was depressed? Look, you're quiet. Was Jesus, okay, question. Was Jesus perfect, yes or no? Do you think Jesus was discouraged? Why are you so, come on. Do perfect people get discouraged? Was Jesus uh, Superman? Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. Listen to what Ellen White says. After Gabriel encourages Jesus, listen to the quote. Christ's agony did not cease, but his, what's that word? Depression, Depression and what? Wow. Wow. Man. What? What? Depression and discouragement, that deals with your mind. Lucifer knows if he can get the person's mind, he has everything. Because the mind controls you. She tells us. I'm trying to stay calm. This, is just, this just blows my mind. The savior of the world was depressed and discouraged. Have you ever been there? If you say no, just live a little longer, you will get there. <laughs> right, Mark? Just live a little longer, it'll happen. Let's think about this. You know, when people are depressed, people use a bad word. Uh, they're crazy. 
You know about mental health is real popular nowadays? They're crazy, man. You're depressed. You're discouraged. You're crazy. You need to take some pills. Oh, you're a mess. You need to see a psychiatrist. No. Look, if you are depressed in this building, if you are depressed or discouraged tonight, you are not crazy. Amen. You're human. Amen. You're human. You're not crazy. You're a human being. Depression and discouragement. Those are emotions. We are emotional beings. That's how God created us. You are not crazy. You're human. Last text. I'm closing my Bible. You know, we need to find the answer. I love it. What is the answer if I'm going through my personal chaotic situation? What did Jesus do to get him through Come on, come on, y'all. I love it. The Bible says, and being in agony, he what? Prayed, Prayed more what? Prayed. In other words, he took his prayer life to the next degree. Amen. He bumped his prayer life up. Brothers and sisters, whatever we are going through in our chaos, the solution is you better keep on praying. You better keep on seeking. You better keep on talking to God because what Je Jesus kept on talking and Jesus answered the prayer. Why? Because God's will was done. You know, Jesus, he could have taken off in that garden and he would have been right. But he loved us so much, he died. You know, brothers and sisters, I'm done with my notes. We're done. I want you to listen, though. Look. You cannot come to CYC and assume that every single person here is okay. You can't assume that. I was talking to somebody at my church last year. Beautiful couple. Awesome couple. I was with the husband one day. And he said, hey, pastor, you know, you know my wife and, uh, you know, she's always wearing pants. You never see her wearing shorts or a skirt. He said, you know why? Oh, I don't know why. He says, it is because of all the cutting that she does. Because of the severe depression. I'm thinking she's good. I'm thinking she's all right. I guarantee you, someone in this room, you are not all right. And you will say, happy Sabbath, you are not happy whatsoever. I'm all right, but you're all wrong. You're not all right. What is going on in this building? Forget the world. What's going on here? Amen. Talking to someone at my church. I filmed her. I, I, I do like YouTube ministry, these short videos. And the treasurer of my church, really cool. Fired up for Jesus. Suicidal. She had to go to Weimar. You know Weimar Institution in California? She went to Weimar for that 10-day program, spent hundreds of dollars, and now she is thriving in Jesus. But the thing is, when, the thing is though, when she gave her testimony, no one knew. You know why? It is so easy to mask the way we feel. Because, you know, as a Christian, you always got to be happy. Man, what's wrong with you? Man, aren't you an Adventist? You're a sad Adventist? Man, you're supposed to be happy. What's going on with you? You, look, it is okay to not be okay. Two days ago, I called this lady. She's in the hospital. She has cancer. She's my age, 45. That's young. Amen. I'm young. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> so I called this sister in the hospital. She has cancer. And we're talking. And that same day, I had to go to anoint someone else in the hospital. Just two days ago. Anoint someone else in the hospital who has been diagnosed with liver cancer two days ago. And so I'm talking to the sister on the phone, and I'm talking, and I'm listening, and she's going through this and that. And I'm just not feeling it, because so much was on me. 
I got to prepare. I got to do stuff in pre preparation for CYC. I procrastinated. <laughs> and all this stuff is on my mind. I hung up the phone. Of course, I, I didn't hang up on her. But uh, we said our goodbyes. I hung up the phone less than a minute later. You know when somebody calls you by accident? You ever experienced that? Or maybe they call it like a butt dial or something to put a cell phone there, yeah. And so they might call you, but so I look at the phone, I'm like, oh, this is an accident. But I picked it up anyway. I said, hey, Nikki, what's up? She said, are you okay? Just what she said. She said, are you okay? You know what my response was? Man, I'm good, sis. And then I said, you know what I said to her? I said, nah, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. And I told her what's going on and this distress and this, this day was chaotic. And you know what she said? She said, I could tell that you were not okay because of the way you were talking. I said, you can tell just by the tone of my voice? She said, yes. Brothers and sisters, two days ago, I was not okay. I was not okay. I was a mess. And she knew it. You need people like that in your life. You need people like that to hold you accountable. People that say, hey, it's okay not to be okay. I don't think less of you because you're my pastor. And you're depressed or you're discouraged. And this is why we have Calvary. This is the last slide. Jesus Christ, he filled the gap. See, all of us here at CYC, this is us. We all deserve to die the second death. How can we be in the presence of a holy God? Were it not for Calvary. Amen. What Jesus did for all of us, by God's grace, we're going to make it. Amen. I want to make an appeal tonight. Because the Holy Ghost is in the building. Somebody in this building... Right now, you are not okay. Now, we can play games, and we can say, man, I'm all right. Happy Sabbath, Pastor Alvin. Don't make this appeal. Somebody in this building is not okay. You're going through chaos right here. Here's my appeal. If you, young person, it could be you, young people, I don't know what you're going through. I know when I was young like you, I was a mess. The first appeal tonight is, if you are going through something chaos, I'm not talking about you lie every now and then. I'm talking about the chaos runs so deep, no one knows but you and God. I'm talking about deep, deep, and you need to be delivered from something tonight. You need to be delivered from something tonight, tomorrow, can't wait, because you can die in your sleep. You need, I need, we need deliverance tonight. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to pray. Amen. We're going to pray more earnestly. You think, you think you just come here? <laughs> we're not here for entertainment, brothers and sisters. The Holy Ghost wants to change lives this weekend. The, the messages are just going to get better and better. We know that, but are you going to change? Come on, man. We hear sermons all the time. Sermons are nothing new. Are you going to change, though? Am I going to change? If you are going through something extremely chaotic, it can be suicidal ideation. It can be severe depression, discouragement. Your marriage is in a wreck and you need help tonight. This is not a general appeal where everybody stands up. No, no, no. We're not going to play any music either to soften the heart because people respond based on emotion and not conviction, not tonight. They hear that music playing. Oh, no! Not tonight. We want to think and we want to be changed after this weekend. Amen. If you are going through something chaotic, come to this altar right now. I want to see who's going to, somebody's going to come.
This is, remember, this is not general. This is specific. Do not come if you're not, um, deep, deep, deep. You need to change tonight. Who's going to come? Because we're just going to pray. That's all we're going to do is pray. We're going to pray more earnestly. Because the Holy Ghost is moving. That's all. Simple Bible study tonight. Look how simple this stuff is. Basic. Who else needs to come? Who in this building needs to come? It doesn't matter what your friends think or your family members. Who else needs to come for prayer? Come. Just come. Who else? Deep. Amen. We're talking about deep chaos. That's what I'm talking about. I'll stop the appeal when no one, no one else comes. But we have to pray. Only the Holy Ghost can do this because Alvin Mirage can never convict somebody of sin. Only the Holy Ghost can lead somebody to move. I can never do that. Who else needs to come? We're just going to pray. That's it. Who else? All we're going to do is pray. You're going through deep, deep chaos. And we need deliverance right now. Tomorrow cannot wait. Who else? Anyone else? What about the young people? What about the older folks? The middle aged? Who else needs to come? You want to come? You want to come? Hey, you in a wheelchair? God knows, sister. You're here in your heart. God knows. Who else needs to come? Anyone else before I pray? See the young man right here? This stuff, this stuff is awesome, man. God bless you, bro. Keep on holding on, young man. Anyone else before we pray? Just a simple appeal. You're going through chaos. Let's pray. That's what Jesus did. Anyone else? People still coming, so I'm not going to stop. This is awesome right here. <laughs> you guys in high school, right? Yeah. This stuff is awesome. God bless you, bro. God bless you, sis. You're all in high school, right? Yeah. When I was in high school, I could never move in front of my friends. But you know what? This is a different generation. Even though this world is in chaos, God is raising up young people to finish this work. Yeah. Look at this. Holy Ghost. God bless you. Bless you, sis. Look at these young Look, Look at this. I love it. Because you never know what someone is going through. You never know the chaos that someone is facing in life. But I thank God, I believe with all my heart, chains are going to be broken this weekend. I guarantee it. I'm going to share another story. Is that okay? And then we're going to pray. I was preaching at 54th Street in Los Angeles. Preached a message. I made an appeal. If you're struggling with something, raise your hand. The sister raised her hand. I don't know what people are struggling with. One year later, I was invited to go back to that church and preach. After the sermon, I'm in the parking lot getting ready to go back to my former church in Eagle Rock. A lady says, hey, pastor, pastor, pastor. Last year when you made that appeal, I raised my hand. I was struggling with gambling. She says she would go to church on Sabbath, go to Las Vegas before the sun went down. That's how bad the conviction, the, the, the addiction was. You know what she said? After that appeal, I never went back. Amen. Why? Because God breaks chains and it doesn't take long. We're going to pray because somebody's going to be delivered of something today. Somebody's going to be delivered of something tonight. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is in the building. Those of you who have come forward, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. And we're going to believe with all of our heart. Whatever chaos we are experiencing, we're going to believe. And even if the chaos continues after the mountain, we're going to believe that God, he has the best for you. God has plans for you. He knows the plans that he has for you to prosper you. Yes, yes. So I'm going to ask this to all kneel. And for those of you in the front, be very, very honest with God. God, this is in my life and it is causing chaos and turmoil and I need these chains broken tonight. Amen. I can't wait to go to bed. I need a broken now. 
If you can do it for that lady addicted to gambling, you can change my heart and the situation now. Father in heaven, I did exactly what you wanted me to do. I'm done. God, I want to pray for every individual who came to this altar. This is not a game. We're not responding to emotional music being played by the piano. No, we're responding by the conviction of the Holy Ghost. This is why we come to CSC. We don't come to CYC to, no, to play games. No, Satan is not playing games. He wants to destroy, kill everyone in this building. But we thank God that God, Jesus, is more powerful. The enemy has been defeated. And so, Lord, I want to pray for these individuals at the altar. I do not know what they're going through, but, Lord, you know I was not okay two nights ago. I was a mess, and I'm a pastor, messed up pastor. Lord, please, whatever your children are going through at this altar, I pray that you will break the chains, that you will bring deliverance, that your children here will not give up on you no matter what transpires when they leave this mountaintop. Because this week, the messages this week, Oh, man, this stuff is going to be life-changing. Oh, God, help us. Just like last year and the previous years, every single sermon that was preached, I needed to hear it. Why? Because pastors need help. I'm not better than these people. Man, we're all sinful. Oh, God, help us. And may we hold on to you for dear life and never give up. I want to pray for these high school young people. This is amazing. God, you have a work for these young people. God, when you come the second time to claim your children as your own, I pray that all of us in this building will be part of the first resurrection or caught up in the air to meet you because we held on to Jesus for dear life while living in this chaotic world. And Lord, we learned tonight the key the living in chaos, we need to pray more earnestly. Lord, when we leave this building, let us not leave just talking frivolously, but let us think. What did God say to me tonight? What did the Holy Spirit say to me tonight? Because we need help. God, we need help. And every single person here, we're not here just, just to be, no. This is orchestrated orchestrated by God to be here this weekend. Lord, I just want to thank you for not leaving me alone behind this pulpit in spite of myself. Lord, before we go to sleep tonight, I pray that everybody in this building, that we will spend time with you in worship. Amen. Even if it's just a few minutes, Lord, we need to spend time with God like never before. Oh, God, help us. Oh, please help us. We're so thankful that Jesus took all of our sins. It was so chaotic. Gabriel literally had to leave heaven. What is that? Thank you for your sacrifice. And I thank you in advance what you're going to do the remainder of this weekend. Life-changing stuff this weekend. Because the Holy Ghost is not playing. Lord, we love you. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for Pastor Johnson and Sister Denise Amen. and for their powerful ministry. Amen. God receives all the glory. Yes. I thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, let every child of the King say, Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, we're going to make it. Amen. Amen. Look. No, I tell my churches all the time, we're going to go to heaven by God's grace. Amen.